Thanks very much, Najia. I'm going to walk through a summary of the paper. You can see the nine countries that were covered on this slide. First, I want to thank Jamie and Sardar for organizing this session, and particularly to thank Salim and Leonardo for bringing their extensive practitioner experience to enrich the conversation today. Since the Alliance is in the middle of doing this series of regional webinars on decentralization, I thought it might be useful to look at where MENA stacks up against other regions. It does in fact lag certainly on um, devolution, but also on deconcentration. Now we can look at a few benchmarks of this. Uh, now, um, this is a local government index and I'm sorry that part of it seems to be cut off by the images of um, the presenters at, at this session. I hadn't really thought about that, but this is drawn from the Varieties of Democracy Index, which I think is one of the better governance sets out there. And this local government index is capturing the level of elected local government closest to citizens. So that could be municipalities, it could be wards, it could be sub-districts, and the like. And we're looking at five regions here in a recent period. BDEM just released 2021 data late last week. And if you focus on the blue line, which is the MENA region, you'll see that it falls below the um, other regions that are recorded here for this period. Now there's a parallel regional government index that measures the middle tiers in subnational governance. governance. The pattern is exactly the same, but the scores are lower across the board. So the MENA region would be scoring below the 0.2 level. Now, what a zero means in this index is there's no elected local governance, either at the mid-tier or at the, at the local level. What a one means is that that elected body or officials are not subject to interference from unelected officials and bodies. So it's, it's looking at um, the relationship between elected and unelected and whether elected even exists. Um, it might be useful then to turn from this regional perspective to look at country perspectives. So what you see on the left is that most local level close to citizens and then the middle tiers is on the right. Now the radar graphs are cramped, I recognize that. It's a lot of countries to get on there and there was a reason to look at both of these indices side by side. I did not put Libya and Yemen on these indices. They made it too crowded. And also, I don't know how you score them at this point in time. I want you to focus on two things here. One is that some countries like Tunisia have made progress at the most local level. In Tunisia's case, that's municipalities, Lebanon, and um, have not made any progress at those middle tiers. If you look at those same two countries, other countries appear to have done better at the regional level. Morocco is a case in point. So uh, progress is not uniform across these tiers of subnational governance. Then if we're looking at a country level and you're able to distinguish between the blue and the red lines, you will see that we see progress in some countries over this 10 year period since the Arab Spring. Tunisia is a good case in point. There is stasis if you look at Lebanon on the left, so basically no movement. And then there is retrenchment, and Iraq is a case of retrenchment in, in the last uh, few years. Were we to be magically a year from now and have Tunisian data for 2022, I think we would unfortunately see substantial retrenchment there as well. Now, look, there's lots of governance indices out there. Um, they face challenges in terms of coding and aggregating complex data. There are weaknesses in all of them. They need to be taken with a grain of salt. Wouldn't use them for detailed diagnostics, but they're helpful for a big overview and benchmark. So let's drill down a bit. There's certainly been progress since the Arab Spring, as Najia noted. I don't wanna suggest it's only since then. Iraq, for example, put a federal system in place with its 2005 constitution, courtesy of the American invasion. Other countries made some progress before the Arab Spring, but the Arab Spring was a profound impetus 
for political reforms, including decentralization. It shook these regimes to their foundations, as you know, and it toppled some of them. So we do see as a result of this uh, firm shaking, regime rhetorical and constitutional commitments to decentralization, and sometimes the constitutional commitments are quite lofty and the rhetorical commitments do in fact um, continue. And then we see legal frameworks that to some extent at least do articulate or flesh out those um, constitutional ambitions. So four of the countries put new constitutions in place which commit to forms of decentralization. Uh, one, Libya passed a transitional constitutional decree. Its constitution was stillborn by virtue of law, uh, sorry, by virtue of war. Yemen put in place a draft federal constitution, which um, fell apart because two of the three conflict actors didn't like the division of regions. Six of the countries put in place new decentralization laws since that Arab Spring uh, period. So let's look at some examples here of progress. In Tunisia, half the country was not encompassed in the municipal system. So in the process of their reforms, the municipality system was extended to the entire country and a system of elected municipal councils and mayors was put in place. Governor's uh, power was somewhat diminished in the process. In Libya, similarly, elected municipal councils was, uh, were put in place. Now, because of the war, uh, elections were rolled out over a period of time and could not be held in all locations. Some of those councils are still operating. Morocco has a very interesting multi-layered system of elected councils. I think the regional level, the top level is um, really quite interesting. It has an elected council, an indirectly elected president of the council. Governor has a lot of power, but Morocco is currently placing a lot of emphasis on trying to get deconcentration of services and economic development to the regions in particular. In Iraq, as a result of the federal constitution and laws that followed, there are, I should say, were elected provincial councils and districts with governors uniquely for the region that are indirectly elected by those councils. And then the recovery of territory after the fall of ISIS uh, created a new interest in decentralization for fear of vociferous tendencies. And we, we saw the um, services of eight line agencies, at least some of them, including health and education, decentralized to the governorate level. And then in Jordan, mayors became elected rather than appointed. Uh, there were new board councils and the highest vote getter in those councils joined the municipal council. And there are now partly elected governorate councils, 15% uh, of the council seats are appointed by the Ministry of the Interior. So those are some of the examples of progress. That said, regime commitment is certainly mixed. Progress has um, not been linear by any stretch of the imagination. The laws often look better than what you find on the ground. What you see is, is not exactly what, what you get. Now, why is this the case? There are a number of reasons some of which I'll describe briefly now and then we'll drill down on. First is this obvious desire to placate angry rest of populations to glue peripheries uh, more closely to the center. Second, some of these regimes, I think notably Morocco and Jordan have a real desire to improve services and local economic development by um, moving powers down and giving people more of a say. They're recognizing that central governments are not performing well at these functions and increasingly worried about the existing social contract. There is a fair amount of virtue signaling that goes on here um, with you know, political reforms across the board. It's to regime's own populations, it's to the international community and to donors. And because these regimes are largely backsliding from a democratic perspective, there is a perceived need to burnish uh, a somewhat rusty veneer. 
Security and patronage protection concerns loom quite large. Patronage glues these regimes together. Um, if we think about the challenges these regimes face, they're really quite profound. Um, state, state failure, territorial fragmentation, third country meddling, if we think of Russia, um, Turkey, Iran, um, climate change with severe drought affecting some of these countries now, economic crisis compounded by COVID, and wait until problems getting Ukrainian wheat and what that does to food prices hit these countries. That could be profoundly destabilizing. So of course, these regimes are reluctant to let go of, of power. And then there are capacity limitations of, across the board, capacity limitations in terms of putting in place complex legal frameworks, and then across the board in terms of implementing those frameworks. Let's um, look at the nature of the legal frameworks first. They're part of the problem. They're often incomplete, they're ambiguous. The institutional relationships are often scrambled in them. Now, for one, it's bound to take time to convert constitutions into laws, laws into the implementing regulations and policies, and then to get rid of old laws on the books that are no longer relevant and could be used to interfere with the intent of the new laws. There are some deliberate gaps in these frameworks. If we think of Egypt and Lebanon, they do not have certain constitutionally required councils. Often these laws are drafted by civil servants and lawyers. There's no surprise with, with that. They're the best geared to draft them, but when it's done without citizen or civil society input, then um, there's less understanding of needs at the local level of preferences and often civil servants at the center are more interested in protecting their power than they are in sharing it. Some of these laws are severely underspecified. Libya's law 59 really doesn't spell out municipal relationships with other state entities and are too ambitious. That's arguably the case for Libya as well where the new regime was trying to build on the very thin institutional veneer left behind by Gaddafi. And then institutional relationships are really complex to navigate with lots of authorities involved in any given task. Um, my best, probably really my worst example of this comes from Basra in the summer of 2018, where uh, the water supply was contaminated sending 118,000 people to the hospital, sickening many more, of course. There were eight federal agencies and ministries involved in Basra's water supply, six local agencies, and the governor's office. So you can see that why this would have made a, a mess that had damaging consequences for citizens. And then there are design challenges in some of these frameworks, some, uh, uh, often deliberate. In Lebanon, the municipalities are simply too small to do very much. Now they're able to form unions and that helps overcome some of these barriers. If we look at implementation for a minute, implementation's awfully partial, often partial. That has something to do with the nature of, of the frameworks being somewhat problematic, but it's also deliberate. Some examples of on the deliberate side, uh, provincial and district elections were due in Iraq in 2018. They still have not been held. In 2019, the elected governorate and district councils were dismissed by the parliament. Uh, and uh, that leaves the indirectly elected governors in charge. And then in Tunisia, the president in December, and he's gathering all the reins of power into his hands at the moment, uh, was suspended much of the constitution and more recently he said he was dissolving the ministry of local affairs and replace and placing much of its power back where it had been under ben ali the ministry of the interior now the ministry of the interior and uh, my earlier mention of security brings us back to these points security concerns means that these political systems largely remain centralized they come out of very centralized histories. There's no reason those legacies would be easy to overcome. So ministries of the interior generally play an outsized role at all levels of subnational governance. They have their own uh, 
parallel authorities and communication channels going right down to the local level. Governors generally report to the Ministry of, of the Interior and hold tremendous sway right down um, to the municipal level. We can think of um, Morocco where municipal councils will often vet their decisions with the governor formally or informally so that they don't end up on his bad side if they make the wrong decision. Now the 2011 constitution said that uh, the Ministry of Interior no longer had any say over municipal councils, but the governor who reports to that ministry still has sway. Governors are generally appointed by prime ministers, kings, presidents. Those of Assad are either from senior levels in the intelligence services or maybe close to the family itself. So they wield um, significant power. So one exception here, where they were indirectly elected is in Iraq, but there's a Supreme Court decision that says that governors are employees of the federal government, never mind who elected them, and as such, they can be discharged by the parliament if it wants to do so. Uh, the formal decision space for subnational governments is not the same as the real decision space. I just gave that Morocco an example of municipalities. Um, so that, that stands for this bullet. Sometimes the middle tiers of subnational governance are just missing. They haven't been elected. And then in Syria, voters know who's going to win local council elections before those elections are held because the candidates are selected by um, the regime. Patronage concerns are also looming quite large. If you push powers down, you potentially risk rival networks emerging you lose patronage resources that help you um, keep elites at various levels uh, attached to your side. All right, let's look a little bit at subnational government attributes here. They have limited authorities, I mean, always at the most local level, they're responsible for solid waste disposal, aren't they? They look after public markets and public parks, public hygiene, sports, youth, street lighting, street cleaning, sometimes limited responsibilities um, for services. In the case of um, Jordan now, municipalities can assemble priority lists of development needs and funnel those up to the regional uh, executive council appointed where they those priorities may get configured into regional development plans. At the regional levels, you see more responsibility for uh, regional development planning, local economic development in uh, Morocco. The regions are responsible for vocational training, so they'll have some service to the provision often at that level. Their resources and capacity are really quite um, limited. Uh, they're either under or overstaffed. Lebanon's municipalities are understaffed. Morocco's rural municipalities are understaffed. There's often overstaffing as well. Something like 85% of the Libyan workforce is in the public sector, often at subnational government levels. So most local governments are spending a high proportion of their income on salaries, leaving less money, of course, for services, investment and operations and maintenance. They um, also have limited resources. There's very weak own source revenues. For most cases, they're more than 50% reliant on central government transfers. They do a poor job often collecting taxes. And it has to be said that the money to be garnered from certain taxes and fees actually adds up to less than the cost of collecting them. So Lebanon doesn't bother in some cases, it's just not worth the investment and they don't have the manpower. Um, in terms of uh, central government transfers, Morocco does about the best. It transfers about 12% of government expenditure to the subnational level. That's only slightly below the median for um, OECD lower middle income countries. For Jordan and Tunisia, it's 8%. Lebanon, it's 6%. I don't know if those percentages still hold under um, economic crisis. 
One of the problems with central level transfers is that the receipt of them can be late, it can be erratic, and sometimes it's driven by uh, patronage. So Lebanese municipalities are dependent on a quote unquote independent municipal fund. And how much you get and when you get it depends a lot on your connections to central elites. There are gender quotas in six countries. Tunisia has the best at a 50-50 split and you have to alternate men and women on the party lists. Um, Syria and Yemen don't have um, uh, gender quotas. Lebanon doesn't either. Lebanese women have been arguing for gender quotas for years, haven't been able to get them. Two countries, Tunisia and Egypt have youth quotas. Doesn't matter for Egypt because they don't have any of the elected councils they're supposed to have at this point. Citizen demand, it, it, it exists. I mean, we see decentralizing reforms when um, there's rising opposition. Someone writing about um, Iraq described decentralization as a political process designed to salvage the state. So these are top-down reforms when regimes are worried. There is popular pressure and, and demand. Um, it just doesn't look like it's, it's really sustained. Now, demand sometimes goes back a long way in Lebanon to the uh, French mandate. But when there is so much wrong at the center, the tendency is to focus on reforms at the center and not tinker at the periphery. The one exception for sustained demand that I can think of, and others of you may know of others, is Southern Yemenis who want separate state for the most part, not decentralization. There's a profound lack of trust in subnational governments in most of these countries, Iraq and Libya, fall to the bottom in Afrobarometer surveys. The Iraqi population was really quite annoyed at the infighting between provincial councils and the governors they elected. This was infighting largely over um, assets and patronage resources and at egregious levels of corruption. You can also see the lack of trust or confusion about roles and responsibilities in the very low voter turnout for um, subnational government elections, you know, 10 to 30 percent in some cases. I'm going to look only briefly at the three conflict affected states, and that's because your third session is on this. Uh, what we see here is not top down decentralization, it's bottom up decentralization as an artifact of state failure, territorial fragmentation, and civil war. Nonetheless, these areas aren't without governance, and we do see hybrid uh, varieties of local government emerge that um, might be some diverse uh, manifestation of formally elected local councillors, which you can still find in some Libyan jurisdictions, informal or traditional leaders, members of the private sector, militias, insurgents, external actors, and, and the like. And there's a lot of jockeying for power that goes on with violence as one tool used in the bargaining. Now, where you get some balance of power among the elite, some ability to negotiate with insurgents and extremists, and some resources that, as Marib in Yemen had from oil revenues, you will see somewhat better governance and some more inclination to try and help people and provide services. In Libya and Yemen, this applies less to Syria. You're going to need strong forms of local autonomy to make peace. I mean, first, first you need um, movement toward a grand elite bargain. I don't think you're going to get that in Libya. That country does not look like it can be put back together again. Uh, Libya was on the path to a grand elite bargain that is in serious danger now with two rival governments in uh, Tobruk, Tobruk and Tripoli and um, as tensions growing between East and West. And let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening.